Hello and welcome to Boxer's Shorts. I'm Adam Boxer and I'm a science teacher trying to help you understand more of GCSE science. In these short videos, I will try and take difficult concepts from GCSE science, break them down, um, help you understand them, and then do some practice questions on those concepts. In terms of some general tips for using these videos, definitely do not have your phone on or anywhere around you. It's a distraction and it means you won't be able to concentrate properly. The same applies for other tabs on your computer. So don't have your social media tabs open on your computer or laptop. It will just distract you. I'm going to ask you to do some questions. If you don't actually do them, you won't actually learn anything. So make sure when I do ask you to do those questions, you do them. And finally, let me know in the comments if there is a topic that you want me to cover. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can subscribe and just let me know if there's something you want me to do for you. Okay, today we're going to look at energy resources, um, which is really about how we get energy. Uh, before we can talk about how we get energy, we need to talk about what we need energy for. We need energy principally for three things. One, heating. Two, electricity. Electricity. And three, transport. So if you woke up this morning and your house was warm, that's because you have heating. Well, where does the energy to warm your house come from? If you charge your phone, or actually if you're watching this video, you are using electricity. Well, where does the energy for that come from? And finally, if you ever took a bus, or a car, or a train, or a plane, or a boat, there will have been energy that powered, that moved that boat, or plane, or train, or car, or bus. Where did that energy come from? What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a whole load of different energy resources and how we get all this different energy. Now, it's incredibly important this stuff because not only is it part of your exam but also it's about um, it's about your life and it's about the decisions that you make in your life and the biggest crisis facing our generation which is of course climate change you'll learn more about that in chemistry but this is all kind of crucial to understanding what climate change is where it comes from and how we kind of deal with it now I'm gonna be listing loads of different energy resources and what I would recommend in terms of the way that you follow along today is that you try and draw yourself up a table and your table should have these headings resource uses source advantages and disadvantages and essentially as we go through the video you should be filling out this table if you're looking for a ready filled out one, well, that's okay. It's better to do your own one. But if you're looking for a ready filled out one, then you can go to BBC Bite Size. They have a nice one that uses different headings, but it's got similar information. Or you can get hold of a copy of the Oxford Revised Combined Science uh, Revision Guide, uh, which I was a part of writing. And there's a really, really nice table that summarizes all the information. And that's actually the table that I'm going to be using throughout this video. So draw up that table and then we'll get ready to start these resources broadly there are two main category two main categories of resources we have ones ones which are called non renewable and we have ones which are called renewable and these words may sound familiar to you ready within non renewable we have two main types the first main type is called a fossil fuel and there are three types of fossil fuels. There is something called coal, there is something called oil, and there is something called natural gas. We also have energy that comes from nuclear resources. We're going to learn in more detail about each of these. I just want to kind of give you an overview. Now within renewable, we have a whole load of different ones. We have solar, which means it comes from the sun. We have ones that are to do with water, and there are three different types to do with water. We've got hydroelectric, hydroelectric, we have waves, and we have tidal. Uh, what other ones do we have? We've got wind, we've got something called geothermal, which is to do with the heat that is underground. And finally, we have biofuels. 
We will look at each of these individually, but essentially 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. These should be the um, rows on your table. So remember we drew out a table, so the rows on the table are these 11 things. And we will go one by one through each one. All right, so let's start with our non-renewables. Now, the majority of our energy comes from non-renewable resources and has done since the uh, Industrial Revolution, when we first started using fossil fuels. Let's talk first about coal. So coal is like a black rock. It comes from uh, trees that died many, many millions of years ago. Uh, they get buried in dirt and essentially all the energy that those trees were storing up throughout their life gets stored up in the coal. Uh, so they get buried in the dirt, they get compressed, squeezed over time, and eventually, over millions of years, it turns to this black rock-like substance called coal. Nowadays, we use coal to, we dig it up from underground, and we use it mostly in power plants for electricity. So the main use of coal would be electricity. Source, where is it from? It's underground. Uh, trees that died many millions of years ago. Um, and advantages and disadvantages I'll get to soon, because they're all really the same for coal, oil, and natural gas. Oil, um, where does that come from? It also comes from underground, um, and it's mostly, well, it's not mostly under the ocean, but there, you know, there's a lot of it under the oceans. Uh, we use it for generating electricity, uh, we use it for transport, so petrol comes from crude oil, diesel comes from crude oil, kerosene, which is jet fuel, comes from crude oil. Uh, we also use a bit of it for heating as well. And then finally, natural gas, um, so that was coal, that was oil, sorry, and now natural gas. So natural gas we also use to generate electricity. We also use it a lot for heating. We don't use it for transport, but we do use it a lot for heating. So most modern homes which have central heating, their boiler, they'll be burning natural gas inside that boiler. The advantages and disadvantages for these three are the same for all of them. Um, so start with, there's a lot of it at the moment. We can get a lot of it very easily. Um, it's and part of that makes means it's reliable. So there's not going to be one day where you like you open your coal cupboard, you're like, oh, there's no coal here because we can monitor very easily how much coal there's going to be. Uh, it doesn't depend on anything other than how much coal we dig up from the ground. The same applies for oil and natural gas. And compared to some of the other methods, it's quite cheap to extract and to use it. There are major disadvantages with these. Uh, the first is that they're non-renewable. Non-renewable means it will run out. That's because even though there are theoretically fossil fuels still be still being produced, they take millions of years to form. And because we're taking them out so quickly, uh, we're going to run out of them pretty damn soon. Uh, and that's what non-renewable means. So the first thing is that they're going to run out. If you build a country and you're using these for power and you're using nothing else, well, what are you going to do in 40 to 50 years when they run out? Suddenly you've got no uh, energy for heating, transport, electricity. Um, they also release carbon dioxide when they're burned. This is one of the major problems. They release carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. This is a greenhouse gas and it causes climate change. You'll learn loads about that in chemistry. You'll also learn about how they release other polluting gases like sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain. And also you'll have seen in the news that oil, when it's being transported, if the ship sinks or if there's a problem, can cause an oil spill or an oil slick, um, which can kill loads and loads of marine life, fish, birds, everything it can be really, really, really bad for the environment. Nuclear is one of the most uh, exciting and also scary um, uh, energy resources. Um, and it essentially comes from uh, naturally occurring elements like uranium. So you take a nice big block of uranium and you use really specialized um, physical processes. And essentially you get the atoms. So if you imagine that uranium is made of like loads of atoms all lined up like this. So say you get the atoms to fall apart. Um, and when they do that, and it, you know, obviously it's not quite this neat, it's, it's way more complicated than that. But essentially when they do that, they release a massive, massive, massive 
amount of energy. Uh, it's called nuclear fission, and it's when the, the nucleus of an atom splits apart and it releases a mass amount of energy. You can then harness that energy, use that to say heat up some water, uh, the water turns to steam, and the steam you can push through special pipes and get it to go into a machine called a turbine, um, which runs the whole way through energy resource. A turbine essentially is something that spins and generates electricity. And if you can get nuclear power to heat up water enough that it boils, turns to steam, pushes that, pushes through the pipe, pushes the turbine, makes it spin, generates a whole load of electricity. Advantages and disadvantages. So first thing is it's considered non-renewable because eventually this stuff, the uranium and plutonium and whatever people happen to be using, um, will eventually run out. So that's number one. Uh, we don't use it for anything other than electricity. There's just too much energy involved. We do have some niche military applications. Um, like nuclear subs, which have um, like small nuclear reactors on them, so they last longer, they need less fuel. Um, but, but broadly, we just use it for um, electricity production because the amount of energy is just too large. Uh, advantages then, a massive, massive, massive amount of energy. They're very reliable. Um, so you, just, you can just control how much energy is coming out of your plant by how much uranium you're putting in. Um, there's no polluting gas. There's no greenhouse gas. Um, Da, 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 and yeah, you only need a small amount of fuel and you get such a huge amount of energy. What are the disadvantages? Um, first thing, building a nuclear power plant is expensive. Uh, if you want to shut down a nuclear power plant, it's quite complicated. It's called decommissioning. If you want to shut down like a coal power plant, it's really easy. You just close the doors, lock them, knock it down, build flats. Very easy. You can't do that with a nuclear power plant. The reason for that is because this stuff, the uranium, before you use it and after you use it is radioactive, which means if a person comes into contact with it, so if either physical contact or from a distance, uh, it can give them cancer and kill them. And if you get too close to it, it'll just kill you really, really, really very fast. Um, and the whole power plant becomes um, problematic in that sense. So other areas of the power plant that were close to the uranium can also become radioactive in that way. Um, so you have to decommission them, which is a very complicated and expensive process. Um, the getting rid of the uranium when you're done with it. So after this process has taken place, it's still radioactive. So getting rid of it is dangerous. It's difficult. It's expensive. Um, and sometimes it can be stored for decades before it is safe to be handled or touched. Um, there is also the danger of nuclear fallout, which is when a nuclear power plant goes wrong. Uh, recently, there was an example, well, I say recently, it was, it was quite a while ago, but um, Fukushima in Japan, when the power plant went into meltdown, which is highly problematic. The most famous example is Chernobyl, which was a uh, Soviet era power plant, um, and it caused the death, death of thousands of people. Um, and it's still a massive radioactive site, it killed animals, plants, the whole area is completely uninhabitable. Uh, there was recently a documentary where it's a kind of a historical drama almost um, that uh, aired on Sky called Chernobyl. It was only five episodes and it's absolutely amazing. So if you do get the chance, definitely watch that. So that was nuclear energy. Okay, let's get started on the renewable stuff. Um, there's a whole lot of um, different renewable ones you need to know about. Uh, let's take an example of solar. So you've got the sun. Sun is constantly giving off loads of energy to us, which is great. Um, and we can harness that energy in two different ways. One involves having that energy onto what's called a solar uh, cell. Solar cell, through incredibly exciting physics that we're not going to go into, turns that energy into electricity. Another one, it looks very similar, Oops, sorry, that is a dreadful drawing, but it's called a solar panel. And what the solar panel does, instead of uh, making electricity, you have like really thin pipes full of water going behind it, and it heats up those water. So it's kind of heating, the transfer there is heating, that's what we use it for. Um, what are our advantages here? You can use them, you can put a solar cell, you know, if someone's got a farm out in the middle of Africa where there are no power plants, there's nothing anywhere close to you, you can just put a solar cell and solar panel up there um, and that will give you, um, you know, loads of energy, that would apply places in the Middle East where you've got just desert and you've got really remote uh, villages, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, like I mentioned, uh, are kind of key 
Um, any, basically anywhere where you've got large amounts of desert and wastelands where there's not much going on will be good for this kind of thing. Uh, they're cheap to run once you put them up uh, and there's no pollution or greenhouse gases from them. The one problem, well one major problem is what happens if there's a cloud in front of the sun? Well then you don't get much energy that day so the supply depends on the weather, they're quite expensive to buy, quite expensive to install um, and the problem is in terms of the amount of energy they probably don't quite produce enough, um, enough for our requirements. So that's solar. What's up next? We have the water ones. Uh, so one of them is hydroelectric, um, so essentially what you have is you've got a river and instead of letting the river run its course you build this big thing called a dam over the river. So you've got the river that was over there and then over time the river builds up and you get this big lake called a reservoir and then you have your river coming out the bottom here and you just have like a really narrow channel and whenever you want to you let the water come down here. The water turns these big spinny things called turbines and generates energy from that. We use that for electricity. Uh, what are the advantages of this? It's quite low running cost once it's built. Um, there's no, you don't need to buy any fuel. And again, it's quite reliable. You know, this lake doesn't just vanish overnight. It's quite reliable. You say, well, how much energy do I need today? Oh, I need this amount of energy. I'll just open the gates a bit and see how much energy comes through. That's great. Um, what are the disadvantages? They're expensive to build. Uh, you've also flooded a massive area here. So if you look at that from above ground, originally you've got a river like that, and now you've got a massive lake like that, and any like trees or anything living there is now flooded, which is a bit of a problem. So that destroys habitats. Um, and there is also, this is a bit niche, but it does happen as well, that once you flood it, let's say you had like a tree um, that you've now flooded. That is a tree, by the way in case you weren't sure. Um, when that's like sunk under the water it rots and it can produce um, some greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. So there are your advantages and disadvantages of the hydroelectric energy. Next up in our um, list of renewable energy resources is Tidal. Um, tides is really cool um, and for many people watching this video you might not even be aware what tides are but essentially if you know people who live by the coast will know all about this um, essentially the beach kind of looks like this if you go to the beach there's like water and um, there's you making a little sandcastle that's not what sandcastle is shaped like sandcastle like that put a flag in the top that's great now this is what we call low tide so low tide is when the water is quite low, but then because of the gravitational force of the moon on the planet, the tide actually changes throughout the day and this level of water will go up and down depending on the time of day, depending on the season, all sorts of things. And so if you walk off and you go get yourself an ice cream, uh, you come back a few hours later, you might find that this water level is now up here and your sand castle is no more. So essentially what, a, what tidal power does is it relies or it harnesses that sort of natural movement. Um, and there was a cool one, there were plans, I don't know if they ever got built in the end, to build one um, outside Cardiff. And essentially you'd have, you'd have a big wall, right? And what you'd do is you'd, so you've got the tide, and let's say the kind of, you're at low tide, like that, and everything's fine. And then what you do is you, you've got holes in the wall, but you seal off that hole while the tide rises. So outside, so like, sorry, I'm not explaining this well at all. Okay, basically you've got the land over here, right? Land is here, right? And it's low tide and everything's fine. And then you close off the wall. And then as the tide rises, it rises like this up here. You wait for the tide to get to its highest point, And then you open up your kind of uh, wall in between the two areas and the water obviously rushes through like this uh, and you put a big turbine which is like we've spoken about it's like a big spinny thing that generates electricity so we can use tidal uh, energy to generate electricity um, advantages and disadvantages advantages it's quite predictable you could go online and you can look at what time the tide is going to be in whichever area forever um, you'll be able to calculate them no problem um, so it's really predictable you can produce a huge amount of electricity because there's a lot of water here 
and if you have a big enough wall so if you've got so if we're looking at, at it from above if you've got the land like this and you build your wall way out like that you can generate huge amount of energy as the water comes rushing in through the walls and i think you can even do it in reverse so you let the water come in so you get the tide nice and high up here you then close it again and then as this goes down you flip it and you let the water go the other way which generates even more electricity um, so you can produce large amounts of electricity there's no fuel cost there's no pollution there's no greenhouse gas um, what are the disadvantages um, obviously it changes aquatic habitats so if you're a fish living in this area you're going to get a bit confused um, and it will definitely mess around with the natural migrations of animals um, can be dangerous for things like boats uh, it means there's whole areas of the sea that are off limits um, they they are very expensive to build and upkeep to maintain um, you can't control the amount of water I guess is that's uh, working here because you you know it's dictated by the tides um, and finally the supply varies depends on the time of, depending on the time of the month so the, the difference in height that the tide has so the difference between high tide and low tide uh, will also vary from um, point in the year to point in the year so even though it's predictable in the sense that you can know what it's going to be that means that you're not going to get the same amount of energy at different points in the year so there are your advantages and disadvantages of tidal next up sorry um, next is wave energy um, now I looked online because I, I didn't actually know much about wave energy uh, and there are it seems to me there's a few different ways of getting wave energy but essentially they all rely on the fact that you've got water right out at sea and you've got wind blowing over the surface of the water now wind is caused originally by the sun so the sun heats up some air um, and that causes it to move around and that movement of air which we call wind kind of forms these waves which go off in any kind of direction as they get closer to the shore uh, what we can do and by the way there are there are a few like I said there are a few different ways of doing this some of them rely on like putting out these kind of buoys um, which either float on top of the water or go underneath the water and essentially they move up and down with the waves and you can get that movement to generate electricity for you uh, but the, the, the one that people seem to be talking about most frequently is that that wave approaches the shore and what you do is you build like a column over here um, and the water goes into the column like this and it will go up and it will come down so you know like waves they go up and they come down and if you're standing at the beach the waves come in and then they go out again you know they kind of have that movement so the water comes in to this column and pushes the air above it up and then the water goes down again and that air comes rushing back down again the water then goes up again and it pushes the air above it up essentially that movement of the air above it is what we're interested in because what we do is we funnel that air then onto a turbine which is that big spinny thing that generates electricity so as that water pushes that pushes up it pushes the air up and through there as the water comes down it pulls the air back down again and it uses that motion to generate electricity here advantages and disadvantages of wave energy uh, low running costs you don't need to do much once it's set up again you don't have to pay for any fuel uh, there's no pollution there's no greenhouse gas um, so those are good things um, in terms of uh, ones so generators which are kind of on the coast so that'll be destroying habitat and things like that uh, if it's floating out at sea you're changing aquatic habitats even if it's over here you're changing aquatic habitats especially the shore is like a really rich place for animals to live um, because it's shallow um, so again messing around with the shoreline can be problematic in terms of aquatic habitats um, again boats and things like that this might be a problem for boats if you've got one floating out on the water like we spoke about before or even underneath the water that can be problematic for boats um, they're very expensive to build and install um, they depend on the weather so when it's really windy you get really high waves if it's not that windy you don't really get many waves at all um, and again you you can't the amount of energy you get from them is not huge so you would need other forms of energy production as well so that is wave energy 
All right, three more to go. Next up, wind energy. This is the one that people uh, tend to be most familiar with, or at least they've seen it before and they know about it a bit. You've got wind energy, which is where you've got these big old wind turbines, um, which they're big and they're white. They look like this, and they've got these like huge sort of blades, uh, and the blades turn around. We have these both onshore, so on land, and we also, sorry, on like land and to demonstrate this on land there's a little person and we also have them they're called offshore so they're in the water um, and to demonstrate they're in the water I will draw you a fish uh, how do you draw fish is that fish that looks a bit like a fish that'll do um, so we have them both on land and in the water uh, and there are plenty of places in the UK where if you um, where they have really big um, what are called wind farms uh, off out to sea and you can see them just off on the horizon um, how do they work so basically the wind just blows against them and the blades spin because of it it's the same as if you um, you know whenever you blow on anything it moves and if you were to blow on like if you ever seen like a pinwheel um, so when you blow on that it spins and essentially that spinning motion turns this turbine that sits inside there and generates electricity advantages not much by way of running cost uh, you, again you don't have to pay for fuel there's no pollution there's no greenhouse gas all good things what are the bad things uh, the supply depends on the weather depends on the wind so if the wind is really strong lots of electricity uh, on a particular day if the wind is not particularly strong on one day then you don't get much uh, electricity that day uh, that's the major disadvantage uh, you also need land quite a bit of land to generate enough electricity you can't just put one up and think oh that's going to supply a city you need to put up quite a lot of the things um, and there is a concern about them producing noise pollution for nearby residents um, so they can be a bit noisy there's you know at any time you know if you go online and you search for people complaining about wind turbines you'll find loads of stuff people people don't want them they don't like the way that they look and things like that um, but in reality it's it, certainly in the UK it's part of our long-term energy strategy to build more of these things so there are advantages and disadvantages of wind energy next up is geothermal energy and this one is super cool um, essentially you've got so like this is the surface of the earth and the layer of the earth that we sit on is called the crust and underneath the crust is loads of really really hot rock so it's super super hot underneath the crust the thing is the crust is not uniform in term in its depth and there are some places on earth where the crust is really kind of quite thin which means to get down to the hot stuff it's not really all that far um, in places like that and we're talking um, places that are along the edges of uh, tectonic plates um, what you can do is you just build a little pipe that goes down into the hot bit and you sort of funnel water through that pipe so you get your pipe going in and going out like this and you just put water down there so you just put more water in there it gets really hot over there and comes out really hot now depending on how hot it is changes what you can do with it so if it's like a bit hot but not crazy hot then what you can do is you just pipe all that water into a house or houses close by and that hot water heats up the house so you don't need to burn any fuel to heat up the house because you just use the hot water coming straight from here to warm up the house if it's really really hot then that water and it's hot enough for the water to turn to steam then you can actually generate electricity because again what you do is you get that steam which is just really 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 hot it's a gas oh, this is dreadful sorry um, so it's really really hot it's a gas and it's coming out really fast and you get it push it through a turbine again and you get it to turn the turbine which generates electricity uh, so that's geothermal um, and it's you know it's commonly in places like Iceland uh, they've got some in uh, California I believe there are some in other places in Central America as well um, what are the advantages what are the disadvantages of these they have relatively low running costs again you don't need to buy any fuel you just put the water straight down and even in some of them they recycle the steam to help pump the water back down again so it's really smart um, there's no pollution or greenhouse gas 
Um, what are the disadvantages? Again, expensive to build, as we've seen with many of these things, but also it's only possible in a few places. So we can't build one of these in the UK because, you know, the, the, the pipes would just be too long. It just doesn't make any sense at all. But if you can get somewhere where it's possible, then um, where, where you're close enough to hot stuff underneath the ground to make it worth it, then geothermal is a good option for you. Last one, um, biofuels. So biofuels are really quite complicated. But essentially to summarize, um, you have, bi uh, biofuel is a fuel derived from something which has been alive. So let's take an example. You've got loads of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you plant a certain type of sugar cane, which is like a big plant that looks like that. That takes in the carbon dioxide and it uses that to grow. We go and chop that down and we do something called fermentation to it. And from that, fermentation, we get something called ethanol. Now I can put that ethanol into my car and I can set fire to it and it will generate energy for my car to drive. When it does that, it releases carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So you take in the carbon dioxide to grow the plant, you then ferment the plant and you get ethanol and that you burn the ethanol, get energy from it and send uh, carbon dioxide off into the atmosphere. Um, we don't really use it too much in the UK, but there are plenty of countries which rely on this quite a lot. So Brazil, for example, uses a whole load of ethanol. You can also get something called biodiesel, which is where you take uh, oils from various plants and you do a similar process. Well, it's not, sorry, it's not similar to this, but it's similar in terms of the processing. So you take the, you get the oil from the plant and then you process it. And then you can use that to, um, you can put that in an engine in a car. Um, and again, it takes in carbon dioxide when the plant is growing and it releases the carbon dioxide when you burn the biofuel later on. Um, there are also other ways to do this. So um, if you have like a farm, um, all of the waste that you have from your farm, so the green waste, so the plant and stuff that you don't need, uh, if you put that in special containers and add special bacteria, they can produce gases from it, which you can then use to burn um, and get energy from as well. So we can use it for electricity, we can use it for powering cars and transport as well. Advantages. So some argue that this process is what's called carbon neutral, which means it doesn't produce more carbon dioxide than it takes in. Obviously, that's not quite true because all of the processes at each point also release carbon dioxide. So you need energy to harvest all of this. Um, it's never 100% efficient, so you don't get everything out that you put in. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of carbon neutral. Um, what else? It's reliable um, because, you know, you can plant this stuff uh, and you know exactly how much you're going to get a year or so later. Um, it can be expensive to produce the biofuels. It re requires a lot of land and especially in Brazil, they're having big problems that you're you know, chopping down loads of forests and stuff to just plant sugarcane. Um, which is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, so you could be using that land for either natural animal habitats, um, or you could be using it to make food for people to eat. Um, uh, and tied up with that is what's called deforestation, which is where, you know, th that's just the word for pulling down the forest, which again, causes loss of habitat. And there are also other problems with pulling down forests that can actually affect um, climate and weather. So not necessarily a good thing. Right, that is all of the energy resources that you need to know about. Uh, in terms of practicing these, basically you just, you need to know a bit about all of them and you need to know their advantages and disadvantages. What I've done for you is I have added to the booklet, which is on the website that is linked in the description here, right at the end of that booklet, I've added some exam style questions with a mark scheme. So to give you a flavor for what the questions that you're likely to get asked are. So sometimes they are straight um, recall advantage disadvantage style things. So they'll say name two disadvantages of wind power or give two advantages of geothermal power. Um, and other times they'll give you loads of data and they'll ask you to analyze the data or compare um, two different ways of producing power. So you need to be ready both for shorter questions and for longer extended response ones. That is actually the end of the energy unit. Um, if you've made it this far, well done. Thank you very much for listening. Um, please do remember to subscribe. And if there are any topics that you want me to cover, please do let me know. Cheers.